I'm a specialist in plastic and reconstructive surgery and in fashion and body aesthetic surgery. In the fashion line of bioscience, we can find different products inside Genafil. Genafil uh, have a non gross leak hyaluronic acid that is called Genafil Fine that we will try uh, we will use for hydration. We will have two different hyaluronic acids that are cross-linked that are used for filling. And we have a special one that is an hybrid hyaluronic acid that is called Genefil DX and what's uh, the principal item of this presentation. So with the facial line, we can treat every part of the skin. With the fine, with a non cross leak one, we can treat the superficial part of dermis with fillers in that are soft touch and soft fill that cross link of hyaluronic acid, we can fill the medium and the deepest part of the dermis. And with Genefil DX, we will treat only the deepest part of the skin and the periosteums right, with an injection in the supra periosteum plane. So what is Genefil DX? Genefil DX is a filler that is a combination of hyaluronic acid and dextranomer. The dextranomer is a glucan that makes a scaffold where the hyaluronic acid go inside. So it is uh, going to be a filler that it's big, big particles, and makes and um, it avoids the migration of the products, and it will have a long-lasting effect. This is because the hyaluronic acid, which is inside the dextranomer, cannot be um, treated by hyaluronidasa from the uh, body or that we inject from outside. So it's a very good product, but it's a product that must be used for people that uh, have experience because we cannot dilute every part of the filler with hyaluronidasa. Other advantages is that this dextranomer makes a regeneration of the dermis because it mm, produces a collagen, type one collagen, okay? And it is a white filler so we are not going to have Tyndall effect. This is not very important because like I say you, said you before, is a product that we are going to use in a very deep plane. So we don't care about the Tyndall effect, but in some places where skin is very, very thin, it can be important. So I will talk about Genefil DX. I wanna talk about this uh, product in the treatment of the profile of the face the cheeks and in some minutes I will talk about the mandibular area. Like Dr. Constantin said before, with the age and process we can see that there is a loose of a bone at every level in the face, but it's very important in the zygomatic area and in the mandibular area. So if we can have, if we want to have a youthful um, aspect, we need to have a very projective malar and zygomatic area. Every woman want to have a malar, zygomatic and malar area like El Zapataki. But we have another condition that, in, that are not um, related with uh, aging in process, like the vectors of the medial, uh, medial phase. So we can have a negative or positive vector and these vectors will be related uh, with how we look and if we look joyful or not. A negative vector uh, means that our malar bone is behind the line of the eye. So every structure of the eye, it's going to be in, in, in front of the malar bone. So we are going to have more um, bugs um, in the down part of the, of the leaves, and we're going to have a more marked um, tear through. In the positive vectors, it's not going to be this way. So we are going to um, get in older, better than if the people people who have negative vectors. In name, it, you can say a man that have a negative vector. So it looks like the eye is in front of the malar and we can see the bugs and how uh, every part of the, the eye in the downside, it not, uh, doesn't look well. So to treat the malar area, uh, I make different injections. Like Dr. Constantin said before, I always treat before the lateral part of the face. Uh, 
Why? Because if we re make a reposition of the tissues in this part, we're going to use less product in the medial part of the malar area. I choose different points. In the lateral part, the injections are supraperiostical, so I do it with needle. And I choose two or three points along the zygoma. In women, I usually treat three points, and in men, usually treat only two. Because if we mark a lot this uh, part, we're going to feminize uh, the person. So I think in men, it's better not to put a lot of uh, filler in this place. In the medial area, in the malar area, I use normally two points and two different deep uh, of the product. I make a deepest uh, injection inside in, in, in the supraperiosteum place. And I make a more superficial one that is inside the medial malar fat path. That is the uh, video I show you during uh, this presentation. When I make the injection in the bone, I use needle and always we need to aspire because there is a lot of vessels in this in this uh, zone. So if you want to be safe, you need to do things okay. If you um, do something that is wrong, you are going to have problems. So if you're going to put the filler over the bone, you can use needle, but of course, uh, it's very important to be safe. So as part always. When I make the injection in the malar fat pad, in the medial malar fat pad, I use always um, cannula. I do it because this place is a dangerous place because near are the, uh, the vessels of the, uh, the partial vessels, and of course the inforbitary vessels. So uh, I prefer to use always cannula. This cannula is 25 years, no more thin, because if it's thinner, it's dangerous because it can act like it, like it was um, a needle and not a cannula. So the risk or go inside a vessel uh, exists. So I prefer to use um, cannula in this place. Okay. Now, so when I uh, make a middle uh, phase correction, like in this girl that has a um, negative vector in the middle area, I use always Genefil DX. In this uh, patient, we, uh, we have a very, very big improvement only with this filler and without any kind of surgery. So you can say it's spectacular because uh, she looks um, less tired. She looks um, more young. She's a very young woman, and, but now you, we can see the aspect is very, very good. So it's a safe filler, but you need to use it in the correct way. And of course, if we have an older people that is girl, we cannot, cannot do only the middle phase and that's all because the, uh, the aging in pro process acts in every part of the face. So it's necessary to treat every part if we want a really um, and a really improvement like there. We use the DX in the thigomaticomalar uh, area and in the mandibular area. But you can see uh, an improvement of the skin quality. And this is because I use it only Genefield DX, but I use it in the most deep part of dermis, not only supraperiostical. In the cheeks, I use it in the, uh, in the dermal part, but in the deep uh, dermal part. So you can see how uh, collagenization of the skin uh, improves the aspect of, of our patient. So it's very safe. Use it in a field DX because it's a very good product. And that's all for the middle phase. And I will talk to you about this uh, filler for the mandibular area in, in some minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nazareta. So our beautiful before and after um, pictures. And I think we can all agree that um, this was a perfect incorporation of anatomy of product technique to get such a nice result. Now, before we are almost at the end of this webinar and we've already covered one hour and 15 minutes, I'm gonna take over now um, for, for one last time before I'm gonna moderate a little bit the Q&A. So you're just a quick quick reminder to um, type in any question you have. Um, there are no stupid questions. 
Um, so um, you're more than invited to, to type your question right now. But um, before this and before I will um, hand over one more time to, to Natsura, who will um, then tell us a little bit about lower face treatments, we're going to treat the lower face anatomy in brief. Um, so obviously, um, when it comes to aging again, this is no surprise to you, we are thinking about loss of bone. And this loss of bone can be um, seen, um, as also has been shown by, by Natsura beautifully in one of the slides, I don't know if you looked at the mandible, by loss of volume right here at the mandibular angle. This is in the lower face, one of the main problems we do have, then obviously also retraction of the mandible. Um, I'm not a maxillofacial surgeon, definitely not very familiar with dental processes, but also we do know that as the teeth are changing, this has a big influence on our entire perioral region. So be aware that not every change that you encounter in the lower third of the mm -hmm. face is a change you can um, treat with filler. Um, those of you who know Steve Cohen um, has done a beautiful post on this and educate your patients on this because you can see right here that this loss of bone volume is nothing you can substitute um, with, with hyaluronic acid. So be aware of the limitations to make the perfect use of this, this great tool that we do have. Now, obviously, um, for fat, um, we've touched on this just as a little repetition. We do know that the superficial jowl fat compartment descends as we get older. Now we have to understand and see that all the perioral musculature is right inserting here into the skin to move our modulus, to move our lower face. And then we do have the platysma covering the deep fat, covering the super, um, the facial artery and facial vein that you will see later on. And then on top, the superficial jowl fat is kind of bulging. It's coming down as we get older and it is causing a disruptive jawline. And um, this is obviously something many patients want to have fixed. Um, again, be aware that right anteriorly here, you do have the mandibular ligament. And um, if you want to kind of build and create the jawline, you need to be aware that you can only add with filler, not subtract. So um, just as a little reminder, when we think about the jawline, um, we do have quite a plain, easy, straightforward anatomy in this region. This makes it beautiful. Why? Because there are five layers that are easily um, separated. We do have our skin as layer one. You can see that in the perioral region, we do have the um, dermal insertion of our perioral musculature as we remove the skin. And then more posteriorly, we do have our subcutaneous fat, our superficial fatty layer. And um, this is quite a big, thick layer that is lying on top of the platysma. This layer can be up to 0.5 centimeters in some patients. So definitely something where you can beautifully move and maneuver a cannula. Now, it's really important to point out um, that this layer does not have any major vessels. The major vessels are below the platysma right here. So if we flip over the platysma, we can see the facial artery, we can see the facial vein. And also, this is really important, the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. Why is this important? For the simple reason that if you insert your cannula too deep and start to manipulate the jawline, you can cause neuropraxia to your marginal mandibular branch. And this will cause a certain asymmetry in the movement of the perioral musculature, especially of the depressor angle oris. So be aware that if you tackle the jawline, if you want to work with your filler in this region, use a cannula and stay superficial. Those are my two kind of recommendations. There are horrific videos in the internet of people doing the walk the line technique down on the mandible with a needle, um, even if they're not hitting the facial artery because they, they tell us, well, I can palpate it, there's still a high chance of hitting the facial vein. Um, obviously, this is not causing necrosis, but can cause severe hematoma in your patient discomfort. So I think staying in the superficial fatty there is um, a perfect plan to, to inject your filler. Um, here again, another dissection where you can actually see how the facial artery and the facial vein are curving from the, from the cervical area, from the neck part, on over the mandible and always covered by the platysma. So right there in the depth. I brought a little video for you um, to just um, see this in, in action. We deflect the skin and the superficial fat. We then kind of have a look on our here platysma, which um, is then continuous with the depressor angle, the oris muscle. You can see this quite nicely. And you can see that just like a blanket, this uh, platysm fibers are covering the facial artery, are covering the facial vein a little bit more posterior. We're going to see them in a second. You can see that this then really fuses also with the depressor angle, the oris. That's the facial artery right here. That's the facial vein right here posteriorly. And you can see that the diameter of the facial vein is actually a little bit bigger 
than the um, diameter of the facial artery. And then obviously in the most poor, more posterior part, you do have the masseter muscle. So be aware that if you insert your cannula right at the mandibular and you don't go too deep, you wanna stay on top within the superficial fatty layer and don't end up below where those major structures are waiting for you. When we speak about the chin, we also need to be aware of our vascular network down there. I think the chin is um, one of the most underrated regions. Um, luckily, it gains a little bit more attention um, the last um, couple of years. Why? Because we need to work on the profile of our patients as well. So what we call profiloplasty, finding this balance between projection of the tip of the nose, projection of upper lip, projection of lower lip, and projection of chin, they all should be in line with what we call the rickets line. This is where we can really put filler to use to create a little bit more projection right here in the lower face to elongate this. And a really nice side effect is what we call the jawline expansion mechanism is if you create more projection here, you're also smoothening the skin here. We do know this from face, lift, uh, face um, from neck lift surgery. If we do a cut right here anteriorly, we can redrape the skin a lot. We don't, often don't need a cut behind the ear if you want to redrape the, the skin of the neck. So if we add a little bit more, you can see that this stretches out basically our, our length of skin that is covered right here and gives us a nicer jawline. So chin, definitely one of those areas you should take into consideration when um, treating your patients. Be aware that the mental artery is much more lateral than you would think it is. We do know this from chin implant surgery. The mental artery emerges the mental foramen quite laterally here and then moves up towards the lower lip. And we do not only have the mental artery, this again, um, uh, a picture taken from one of uh, Heejun Kim's publications. You can see how we have a submental artery running over the chin. This one is much more medial and fusing in the midline with the contralateral submental artery and then also the inferior labial artery. So if you inject, my advice for you would be to stay as central in the midline as possible and to go down to the bone. The submental artery shows to be a little bit more superficial. Most of the arteries right here within this chin plexus are running more superficial. So deep injection is, um, is one of the safest ways to perform um, any kind of augmentation in, in the chin region. Regarding the muscles, you can see this quite nicely here. We also do not have any muscles in the midline. We do have two valleys of the mentalis muscle right here. We do have our depressor anguli oris muscles emerging then to the modulus in the lateral direction and the depressor labi inferioris muscle kind of originating from the depressor anguli oris muscle right here. So be aware that there are three muscles, but right here in the midline, the chances of hitting an artery or positioning your, your um, soft tissue filter within facial muscle where you actually do not really want to have it um, is, is the safest point. Now, um, something we already had covered by Andrea, I'm gonna um, throw in my, my two cents of anatomical knowledge right here at this place is definitely when we speak about lips, we need to know the anatomy. Now the anatomy of lips is actually not that hard. We do have a subcutaneous layer. We then do have an intramuscular layer and we do have a submucosal layer. And um, you can see that we also do have a dry and a wet mucosa. Um, often here, this is the, the dry part more or less, and then starts to become the wet part of the mucosa. So we have quite some landmarks. And um, interestingly, the superior and inferior labral artery run in the majority of all times within the submucosal plane. So um, the submucosal plane is where we actually are expecting our inferior labial artery and our superior labial artery, but it can also run intramuscular. So the artery might run within the orbicularis oris muscle or sometimes even subcutaneous, quite superficially here. So um, I think that also clinically, we can all agree on that um, the artery is running in majority of the time submucosal because we can actually palpate it. But be aware that um, we do have um, this potential course also in more superficial parts. And um, this is something to be, to be aware of, to keep in your mind. And then also those arteries are changing planes, right? So it's not always within the submucosal layer, but they can become more superficial. And while this is really important, an occlusion of the labial artery is often not causing a severe complication because uh, the lip is really well perfused. If you inject too much, it might cause a retrograde um, issue. And um, sometimes even in the um, upper lip, we do have one picture here. Some branches are supplying our columella. And if you include them, the bolus is then kind of projected into the tip of the nose. This can cause trouble. Why? Because the arterial plexus right here in the tip of the nose is quite delicate and occlusion of this 
can cause this already very susceptible tissue to ischemic damage. One more thing in terms of relation to the vermilion, the superior label artery is in 100% of the times observed by us in an ultrasound investigation with almost 200 subjects within our vermilion. In the lateral parts, the superior and inferior labial artery are sometimes not within the vermilion of the lip, right? So they're still in the upper lip superior or in the lower lip inferior to our vermilion border. Why? Because they need to find their way into the lip. However, in the midline, in 100% of the cases, you can expect the artery to run within the mucosa. Now, one last um, bit of advice, then was one last bit of observership, um, because this is uh, something we all need to be aware of. If we change the lips, we do have a huge impact on the perception of our patients, of their own self-perception, but also of the perception of other people. And uh, I don't know about you, so um, Nazareth comes from um, Gijon, she told me, um, I think Andreas from Rome, but correct me, or Milan, I'm not sure, we didn't talk about this yet, but I'm sure all of you have a, have a little restaurant or cafe in the city where you sit on a Saturday or Sunday, enjoy a nice glass of wine, and then you see somebody passing by with way too much lips, way too huge lips. And um, I loved about the lips and read it that they were not overdone. So for us, the question was, how do we kind of differentiate between overdone and normal? And when does it actually kind of shift our gaze? So what we did was we kind of created different upper to lower lip ratios and different lip volumes, and then asked 200 people to look at those lips and rate those lips. Now you can see that this is a one to one ratio. This is a one to 1 1.6, one to two and 1.6 to one ratio. So this is the only ratio where the upper lip is bigger than the lower lip. Now see what happens. This is actually the average um, gaze of the participants. And you can see that as the lips get bigger and are kind of deviating from our 1 to 1 1.6, the gaze intensifies on those lips that we um, would consider as rather unattractive. And this is actually the truth. Those lips have been ranked as the most or at least unattractive or most ugly ones, while at the same time, the 1 to 1 1.6 have been rated as the most attractive. You can see that the gaze on those lips is actually not very very intense. So we quantified this, obviously, and there was also a significant difference between those lips. So not only if we speak about upper to lower lip ratio, but also to lip overall size, be aware that changing size and proportions of the lip of your patients is going to cause a huge impact on how their face is going to be perceived. You can see the shift right here from the eyes to the lips to the perioral region. So keep this in mind when you're treating your patients. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happily handing over to Nazareth right now, who will give us an overview of how she is tackling the lower face. Thank you so much, Nazareth. I'm really keen to, to learn from you for the last part of this webinar. So I will talk now about the treatment of the lower part of the face of the mandibular area. With the same product I talked before, that is Genefield DX. Remember that it's a mixture of the dextranomer and gyalidocinic acid. It's an hybrid. Okay, so we are going to use this product in the more deeper, in the, the deepest uh, parts of the skin and supraperiostical. Okay, I'm trying to do it. Hello. Yes, okay. So this is the same image I showed you before. Uh, you can see the reduction of the bone, like Konstantin Frank has said that it, it was a, a splendid um, presentation. So you can see how in the uh, lower part of the face, you can see a reduction of the bone, a very important reduction. This is um, the principal cause of the jowls and uh, the, that we don't have a really good Mm, differential, mm, differentiation between the face and the neck. The uh, cervicofacial angle is loose. So this area is important in the uh, aging in process, but of course it's important in young people because every man wants to have the mandibular of the Superman because this area is very attractive in uh, men. So we are going to treat this area for uh, people that are old and for men that want a masculine initiation and for women that want to uh, improve the cervical uh, facial angle. The first uh, part I treat is the uh, chin. I make a 
augmentation of the chin in two kinds of patients. One patient that have a retrusion of the, uh, of the mental bone. In this uh, kind of patients, I inject the filler in the anterior part of the chin always supraperiodic and always with only a puncture in the middle to avoid the muscles and to avoid the vessels. But we can use this pillar in another part of the, uh, of the chin area. We can put it in the angle or we can put it in the down part. If we use the inferior part, we are going to make an elongation of the mandible. So in this uh, kind of patient, we are going to redrape every skin in this part. So we are going to improve the jaws without making an anterior projection of the chin. So in a chin abasement, like we can see here, we are going to make an injection in the central part, superperiostical in the middle to avoid vessels and muscles. And I go, I'm going to use Genefield DX. In this patient, he wanted a uh, masculinization, so I inject this product in the angle and in the uh, in other parts of the mandible. But I want to show you the advancement advancement of the of the team. If I inject the mandible, I inject different parts of the uh, of this zone. I inject the angle always in the uh, supraperiostical. And I can do it in two places. I can do it in the posterior part. I do it in women because it's going to regrade the skin. But if I want a masculinization, I'm going to put it in the lateral part of the angle. That's because we want to project the mandible laterally. But I never do this in women. In this part, I use needle always and I absorb and I uh, always do an injection supraperiostical. I uh, mark the mandible uh, always, and I mark the part of the jaw because I'm not going to inject anything there for two reasons. The first reason is that I have uh, plenty of tissues there. Everything is, um, is falling down in this place. So I don't want to put more filler in this place. And this place is the place where we are going to find the uh, fascial vessels. So it's a dangerous place to inject. So I usually inject uh, in the anterior part of the jowl and near the chin uh, with a little deposit of filler, like you can see in the image, in a supraperiostical plane, little one in this place. If I want to mark the other part of the mandible, I always use cannula can allow 25 Gs and always in a superficial uh, part because in the deep part, we're going to have a structure that is, uh, are dangerous to be near, like the marginal area, uh, marginal nerve or the vessels. If I put the filler superficial, I'm going to mark a lot of the mandible. Like uh, Dr. Constantine said before in the temporal area, if we use the product very superficial, we are going to get more results with less product. So I reserve the supraperiostical injection for the chin, for the angle, and for the anterior part of the uh, jowl. And in the rest of the mandible, I use this uh, subcutaneous in the deep part of the, uh, the dermis, of course, with canola. This is the injection. I, I didn't know if I put it before. So the profiloplasty, not perfiloplasty, I'm sorry. Uh, it can be used in men, in women, and in young, and in old people. In this case, I can we can see a woman. A woman like wanted to uh, recover the facial, uh, facial neck angle, the big facial angle. So only with the injection of Genefield DX in the chin, like I told you before, not in the anterior part, in the inferior part to make an elongation of the chin and in the angle and subcutaneous in the other part of the mandible, we have a, a beautiful woman that, don't, that looks thinner and have a very beautiful 
the bicofacial angle only with Genefield DX. And we can get masculinization. You can see here only with Genefield DX, we can have a very, very good mandible. Of course, you can um, like it or not, because this is something that people have a, an own uh, perception of themselves. So this man wanted a very marked mandible. So we make an injection of the eggs in the chin, in the inferior part of the chin, in the wrinkle that he has in, in the inferior part of the lips, because this is the one part that have um, less bone with aging in the angle and of course in the mandible. So we can have very nice results. So this is what I wanted to, to talk to you about the X. It's a very safe product, very special product because I think there is nothing similar uh, in other brands. So uh, you can have very good results, but always with safety, please. <laughs>